holy, where's my Batman? Batman? Tiki here, and I'm watching through Batman the Animated Series for the first time, getting close to the end of Season 3, and, uh, alas, we've come upon an episode where Batman's hardly in it. Dragon, what do we do? Well, you see, folks, I reckon long ago I made a vow about to educate Tiki in the ways of Batman the Animated Series, serving and as a spirit tonight, guide to Gotham, in a way. Jump the gun there, sorry. <laughs> and tonight we're talking about Showdown, which is essentially, Dragon, for all intents and purposes, kind of a backdoor Jonah Hex pilot. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, Yeah. <laughs> And you know what, Dragon? I, I quite like it. I mean, this I, I've got major issues with this one when it comes to, uh, you know, obviously this is not a Batman episode. You know, obviously it's like when we're looking at it in terms of like, you know, the, the big hallmark Batman moments of Batman the Animated Series. This is just not there. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, the brief Batman stuff we get, especially at the end, is cool and in character, mm -hmm. but... Um, but I, I mean, generally speaking, this episode is all about the Jonah Hex, man. This is this really is just the Jonah Hex Ragul Hour. Oh yeah, with a dash of Malcolm McDowell. Oh yes, yes. <laughs> all right, so you got some background? Yes, I do. So this is uh, so a showdown. This is a special one. This was uh, directed by Kevin uh, Altieri. You know, Kevin Altieri. He is uh, he's the Ray Shogul specialist. This guy's a super fan of Ray Shogul, which is why he's directed all the Ray Shogul episodes. He did Off Balance. He did Demons Quest. He did Avatar. All Altieri. This was uh, written by uh, mainly uh, by Joe R. Lansdale, who uh, he did Perchance the Dream. He did uh, Read My Lips, the Ventriloquist episode, and uh, outside of Batman, Papa Hotep. That guy. <laughs> Love me some Joe R. Lansdale. Of course, that's where you have the fun Western dialogue. But also, uh, kind of uh, co-writing the episode, you had Altieri, who basically kind of pitched it with Paul Dini. Who also, you have Altieri, you got Paul Dini, you got Bruce Tim. All three of them wanted in on this episode. So it's kind of it's a, uh, you know, it's kind of like a barn raiser, if you will. Yeah. Studio worked on this was Don Yang, who uh, recently had done uh, Lion and the Unicorn, uh, did Perchance the Dream, and did Zatanna. So I'll list off a few of those. So I'm just going to tell you the origin of this episode, which is really interesting. So the origin of this episode was uh, after a recording session, as they tend to do, Paul Dini and the gang, they get a chat. And, and Paul Dini's talking with Kevin Altieri, and they're kind of talking over, um, hey, if, uh, which which DC character, or honestly, which kind of a character would you love to write or you know do? Spirit, what would you love to write for? And uh, mm -hmm. they kind of kicked around a few names, and they really landed and got hyped up over Jonah Hex. Like, oh, yeah, I'd love to do Jonah Hex. And uh, I guess they kind of realize, oh, wait a minute, you know who's been writing Jonah Hex in the comics lately? Joe R. Lansdale, who has worked on our show. And, uh, you know, and they, they were also kind of talking about another, uh, another, you know, of course, Batman's always kind of like this wonderful melting pot of uh, influences, whether it be Hitchcockian, whether it be, uh, you know, the Flesh or Superman, you know, a lot of, you know, the, the Art Deco style, a lot of influences from all over, as well as some literary ones. And uh, the literary reference in this one was uh, there. I don't know if you're familiar with these at all, Tiki. You might be. Uh, the the Royal Flashman books or the Flashman books. Those ring any bells? No idea. So, no idea. Sorry. Keep it simple. <laughs> all you need to know is that there there's this book series about a cowardly kind of Victorian swashbuckler. Okay, cowardly okay. Victorian swashbuckler. Did a movie starring Malcolm McDowell called uh, Royal Flash. Gee, I wonder if that has anything to do with this episode. Yeah, yeah, but so, <laughs> there's, but you see, like, it paves the way for that. Where, sure, you know, sure. We're talking about this book series. Basically, this Victorian cowardly character is kind of like an anti-hero scoundrel. He's just always kind of always kind of rats out the heroes at the end of the day. He's always, like, leaving them. <laughs> like, there's trouble. He runs the other way. <laughs> so basically, they had this, this gobsmacking idea of, wait a minute, that there's a big historical tie-in. If we want to do, we want to do these three things. We want to do Jonah Hex. Yeah. We we want to do Rachel Ghoul, and we yeah you know, we want to do this 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 character. Rachel Ghoul is kind of our connecting point. Like Rachel Ghoul has major ties to history. What if we made uh, the Royal Flash, uh, Rachel Ghoul's black sheep son? What if we did that? 
<laughs> it's a pretty big what if dragon, but it works so well. I know, like these three elements just kind of all kind of like Raish Ogul being all Terry loves this character. You kind of tie it all together, Raish, and it worked wonders. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Only yeah. in season three can you get an episode like this, kid. Can you imagine <laughs> pitching this in season one? Oh God! <laughs> That's right. what I'm saying. So, like, this is uh, something you can. So Batman's only going to be on screen for like two minutes, yep. and his big action is going to be turning his back and walking away. And I'll bet you, I'll bet you that was all Deanie, because you know Deanie, he loves doing episodes of Minimal Batman. He loves, <laughs> <laughs> loves Minimal. So that's that's what I'm saying. All all it's the tide that raises all ships. This episode, a lot of fun. All right. Okay. Okay, so uh, let's just get right into it. So first yeah. of all, got to acknowledge I love the title screen. Oh yeah, showdown. The, doors, the sweet bar doors. How yeah, can Batman get any better? Old West. I'm in. <laughs> now I just want to see a Jonah Hex walk around character at, at Knott's Berry Farm, Dragon. That's all I want now. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. All right. So we're at a uh, we're at the Gotham Retirement Villas. Basically, the highfalutin kind of retirement community. We start in the uh, in the midst of the Spider-Man clone saga, and we see a bunch of cloned black Spider-Men. Okay, so we have the. Uh, I have to stress that dragon. I'm I, sorry. I was... Sorry. Very much like Spider-Men. Oh no, you're right. We were gonna. I was gonna get to that, but yeah. <laughs> you so yes, we have the uh, the society in parentheses the Society of Shadows because we can't say assassins on Saturday morning television. Right. So yeah, basically, of course, the League of Assassins. It's the eyes. Course, it's the eyes. Yeah, and they redesigned them from the last time we saw them. And it's been a while since we saw True Blue, uh, you know, kind of the Society of Shadows guys. So we kind of gave them some Spider-Man looking mask. And again, it's... I want to say... <laughs> the, honestly, I want to say the animated Spider-Man series is, I think, just getting off the ground around the time of this episode, I think, which is kind of funny, so... Anyway... So, uh, yeah, so we have a, the, the Shadows are pumping a sleeping gas into the vents of the place uh, as they kidnap the resident. Mm -hmm. so we reveal, of course, Rachel Ghoul. It's always a better episode when Rachel Ghoul's in it. And, of course, uh, really cool on rewatch. You can see Rach just, uh, you know, whoever this is that they're kidnapping. A little meaningful to Rach. She definitely takes a pause. Oh, yeah. So, uh, let, let, let's see. So, um... So Batman and Robin fight the Spider-Man clones. Sure. <laughs> so, sorry. Okay, so the point being, nice little bit with Rache, though, the, the, like, you know, lower your guns, they'll sleep for hours. Oh. Of course, Batman comes in with, but I won't. We gotta milk the Batman moments here, because he's not gonna You're be right, you're right. <laughs> but I won't. So Batman and Robin swoop in. My God, they swoop in mid-attack, which is awesome. They swoop in and throw the bolas. Like, that's Batman and Robin. It's like the Dark Knight returns Batman, goes, he throws a battering in the Joker's eye without missing a beat. That's that sort of Batman. There's, he comes, swoops in, he, like, throws the bola instantly. And he kind of mixes it up with these guys as Ray Shnabs, this mysterious old man. So Batman and Robin, they're fighting the shadows. Uh, you know, we have some really cool animation here. Like Batman does this really swift uh, move where he basically kicks a guy, but he he knocks him out with his foot, which is awesome. <laughs> He's like, he, <laughs> like over the guy's head, like he now he hits him in the back of the neck or the head with like the bottom of his foot. Robin, he gets like a really really nasty below the belt punch to this one guy. <laughs> like bam, that guy's out. So the Raish, uh, Raish then escapes. And you know it's an ulterior episode. One, if there's Raish al Ghul. Two, if Raish al Ghul isn't kind of a biplane sort of auto gyro. Oh, God. Yeah, totally. Yeah, this episode is all about that, man. Oh, man. This episode is the king of the biplanes. Because you remember, uh, remember Harley Quinn A, the, the third act of Harley Quinn A with the giant. Yeah, sure. But again, that's an ulterior pitch because he, he loves the old school, <laughs> loves the aerial stuff. <laughs> Very right, uh, so kind of wild, wild west. West esque, if you will. Yeah, this whole episode is pretty much, especially once we get to the third act, a lot of Wild Wild West in the third act. It's basically totally. that good. It's Wild Wild West, except uh, without the silly spiders. Yes, except no John Peters. And I, I kind of read, <laughs> remember that Barry Sonnenfeld book I told you about? Uh, it yes. talks about, because Sonnenfeld directed that. It talks about the experience working on that. It's quite funny. Oh, God. Okay. All right. So, uh, Batman, so Batman and Robin are essentially going to go on a 13 Reasons Why style journey this episode, Dragon. They're going to listen to a tape. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of, it's funny you make that because then the, the end, you know, kind of the little dozer thing we do at the end of these episodes, I, I teased a Batman listens to a, to a book on tape. Mm -hmm. That was, that was where I was coming with it, but you went a little further mm -hmm. with that and I think you landed it nicely. <laughs> Yes, that's that's kind of the 
it's kind of the unromanticized version of it, yes. Yeah. So Batman finds Ra's al Ghul's present, uh, which is a tape. So they're listening to this tape on their way to the airfield. I love seeing Batman do some detective work again. Not a Ra's al Ghul episode with Batman earning the name detective. Of course, of course. Where uh, he sees uh, Batman very smartly. He, he figures the gyro is not like a, it's not a long range craft. He's got to go to a, he's got a rendezvous with a bigger craft as he's going to an airfield. So he narrows down the airfields that are close, and he finds Lazarus. And he's Batman's thinking to himself. This is too easy for Ra's al Ghul. He wants us to find him. We're walking into a trap here. And, of course, Robin says, well, we've got to get it. Let's look for a clue within the little tape he left us. So they listen to a tape, uh, which is our framing device for the for the flashback, essentially, for the majority of the episode. <laughs> and, uh, again, David Warner should do all books on – he should do all audio books. Oh, audio, God. Get in on this before it's too late, man. <laughs> David Warner the audio books. Please, do it now. Anyway. So, uh, race, of course, race uh, begins. I anticipated, anticipated, uh, I anticipated, uh, you'd be, you'd be here, detective. And I hope my story will cause you to reconsider your pursuit. Mm -hmm. Love David Warner. Okay. So, uh, we go to 1883, the old West. And when this started dragging, this really shook me. I was like, wait, we're doing this? Oh, man. That's why I got to listen to the Dozier things I do at the end, because it gives you a clue. I listened to the Dozier <laughs> things. The main thing, the, main, the main thing I got out of the Dozier thing is that Batman was hardly in the episode. Yeah. All right? I, I, I selectively listened to the Dozier no. thing. <laughs> I know. <I'm>, I <laughs> All right. So, uh, essentially, uh, I love this idea that Ra's Ghul is very anti-Manifest uh, uh, Destiny with the Old West, which is oh. really, is, it makes sense. He uh, basically is taught, he, he frames our story here at the start saying uh, the government was expanding ruthlessly westward, which again, sure. he's very anti-Manifest uh, Destiny. And then we see uh, Jonah Hex. I love how we build him up. It's not a West. Oh, yeah, big build up, up there, there, big build up. Jonah Hex is walking the railroad. Of course, the railroad's very key within the events of our story, so that's really appropriate. Again, the whole Western expansion of it all, the manifest destiny. He's walking this railroad, and everyone's like, we're not seeing what he looks like from the front. He's just carrying a saddle because this horse gave out on him. Uh, build up an old West entrance. Uh, cowboy with a saddle. He goes, to the, he goes to the Devil's Hole. The town of Devil's Hole, which you know is a bad town. We have names <laughs> like that. So the people are fleeing around him because he has a reputation. We build him up. Uh, right. Hex and but yeah. I love how well I love how it's mostly like yeah he has a reputation. But at first we think that he's the bad guy. You know what I mean? At least that's what I got out of it. At first we think he's there to cause trouble. You know he's he's there for the high noon showdown, if you will. <laughs> but what I love about it is that it kind of subverts it. We'll get there. Which is the whole point of the character. He looks like sure, a nasty sure. hombre, but the guy's got morals. The guy's got a, you know, he's got a platitude. Yep. So, um, anyway, so uh, Hex, he uh, enters a saloon, and the barmaid, uh, and the, the, the barmaid asks him uh, what he wants. He says, water, ma'am, and a clean glass. <laughs> Greg, can we just agree that this episode is like in, in like less than 20 minutes because we got the Batman framing device a better... A better Jonah Hex movie than the, or a better Jonah Hex story than the entire Jonah Hex movie. Without question, and again, this is yet again the DC, DC twice doing a better Jonah Hex movie in and again doing right, their thing right. where they always do the animated precursor that is many times better than the, <laughs> better than the live action result. Oh God, yeah. Because you had the, do you, do you remember what? Did you ever watch that Jonah Hex short animated movie? I think my sense. Yeah. Because again, that was absolutely that's the that's exactly the example. This was kind of circling around that. Sure, but I mean, even this is like way, way better. <laughs> oh well, uh, one thing real quick, I forgot to mention at the start because yeah. I have a fun thing about this episode. I actually I kind of sold this episode to Jonah Hex himself. I uh, at, at, at Comic Con, uh, I think it was last year. Last year, the year before, I talked to the guy who plays Jonah Hex on Legends of Tomorrow. The guy who's currently playing Jonah Hex. He's really good, by the way. Jonathan uh, Jonathan Sheck. Uh -huh. Great guy, and we were just geeking out talking about Jonah Hex, and I, I kind of he he saw the Thomas Jane, he saw the anime one I just told you about, yeah. but uh, I don't think he saw Showdown, so I told him all oh, about wow. Showdown. Blew nice, mind. nice, cool. Yeah, and it was a point. We had a nice little conversation again. Relative, I, just, just like uh, just like David Mazuz or however you, how, however hell you pronounce that name, like you yeah. might have introduced him to Phantasm. Yeah, I might have. I hope so. I, I gave him. <laughs> it's in his hands, folks. I put it in his hands. I don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Anyway, all right, all right. So getting back on point here. Anyway, so 
Jonah Hex enters the place a, a water man in a clean glass. Of course, we reveal uh, the famous thing about Jonah Hex. He's, he's really scarred. He kind of has like a two-faced eye, if you will. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Definitely. Definitely yeah. two-faced eye. Yeah. The idea is that Jonah Hex, he's lived a really harsh life. I won't bore you with all the details. Uh, just point being, he got scarred up because of his very interesting life. Mm-hmm. So, um, anyways, of course, the whole place is spooked by him. And, of course, the reputation kind of enters, enters the place. Uh, and also, he's looking for somebody. Who is he looking for, Tiki? Uh, I don't, sorry, I don't have the name on me. Arcady Duval, or Arcady Duval. I knew it was a Duval, but I just didn't, the Arcady, that's like a, that's like a weird name. I'm sorry, I didn't have it offhand. Anyways, sorry, go ahead. Anyway, so he's looking for Arcady Duval, uh, Duval, and he also mentioned this whole, uh, this whole thing, like, um, a horse done gave out on me ten miles back, and it's hotter than, than a shaved coyote and, and with heat rashing, and there's the, Joe R. Lansdale has wonderful dialogue, and the fun, catchy western dialogue, he's done 40s gangster dialogue, and now he's doing old west dialogue, he's a, te- you know, he's an old boy, he's an old boy from mm-hmm. Texas, so he loves doing that sort of stuff, it was really, it's like a natural fit for this one, oh. so Point being, John Hex is a bounty hunter, and he's looking for Arcady Duval, who has a two hundred dollar bounty on him. Of course, we learn anything from Django Unchained. Two hundred dollars was a lot back then. Sure, sure, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, a bounty hunter. This is a uh, yes. It pays. <laughs> yeah, I use it to pay to two hundred dollars. You're a bounty hunter just to pay for my piano lessons. My favorite line in the whole thing. Just to pay for my piano lessons. <laughs> That's what I love about Jonah Hex in this episode, is that I feel like a lot of times they portray Jonah Hex as just, like, very much just, like, you know, dark and gritty and edgy. But, uh, in, in this Jonah Hex, like, he, he does have a, a layer of grit to him, for sure. But, you know, very much so, he's kind of got much more humanity to him than I'm used to seeing from this character. I love it. Absolutely. So, because again, just so you know, as you probably have been told by hundreds of people, like, you know, who, anyone who's ever, if anytime you've had a conversation about Jonah Hex, you see comment sections, you'll know Jonah Hex doesn't bring people back. He doesn't talk to dead people. That's not his thing. He doesn't have that, that stupid ability from the movie. <laughs> oh, I, I, I'm aware. I'm aware. Good man. Good man. I just want to make sure. we got to gotta educate the kids on Jonah Hex. Does not, <laughs> does not talk to the dead. He doesn't like, do a reanimation of the corpse thing. He doesn't do that. I can't. Bring people back from the dead. I don't want to do it, man. <laughs> I don't want to do it. <laughs> okay, okay. So, uh, so uh, the barmaid here. By the way, barmaid, um, she was Samantha from Bewitched. Oh, it's okay. so Elizabeth. Uh, God, um, I'll get her name later. The point being, Elizabeth. Uh, anyways, the point being, Samantha from Bewitched. The main. Montgomery, thank you. Yes, Samantha Montgomery. Blank gun for a second. There. Yes, she. Uh, she... X ray. Oh. <laughs> anyway, so yes, she's. Um, I think I add that off the top of my head. Come I would on. have been proud. I, I, I kind of figured, but I was hoping. You know what? Maybe she didn't. Know. <laughs> <laughs> or anyway, optimism aside here, point being, uh, we'll, we'll be with Bruce Tim loves Bewitched. That was probably his addition, by the way, because he loves Bewitched. Uh. They do like the whole Bewitched Batman episode in Justice League. It's really funny. Anyway, so. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, um, anyway, so she mentions that uh, Arcady came in the town a little while back and he hurt one of her one of her girls real bad. Again, it's implied like there's like a saloon gal, like kind of prostitution thing on the upper level of any saloon you walk into. They can't say it because it's Saturday morning television, but it's kind of implied. And this kind of starts off like my my absolute favorite part of this episode, which is just like, man, I don't I, I don't know much about the Jonah Hex character, but this episode very much implies like he does not fuck around when it comes to violence against women. Yeah, that's a big thing. He he hates violence against women and, and children. He's very mm-hmm. touchy because he had an abusive childhood, and that's that's thing. He's very he's very protective of women. Gotcha. Very gotcha. So, like, I, women feel like, I feel like this episode just nails that element of him, Dragon. What oh, do you yeah. say? Yes, and also he's very protective of working girls too, especially in the old west saloon type oh, of things. Uh-huh. This is absolutely up his alley. It's perfect for him. So oh, that's like the human motivating factor. City. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Anyways. Okay. So point being, uh, she says, "Yeah, I think I, uh, I think I can uh, point you in his direction." Essentially, and that's really nice. I love the pleasantries bit here. Where, you know, she like she the drinks on the house. Like she puts his money back. Yeah. yeah. Slides it across the table, which is really nice. Enter the sheriff. Who comes in the tough talk hex? Oh, the Jonah hex! Everyone's running away from the saloon. Can only mean one thing. 
Jonah X is in town. I love this. I love the archetypal element of this episode, the historical and the archetypal thing, where, again, this is like a Batman-Bullock dynamic. It's kind of the implication here. It's like, again, our hero going up against Ray Shao Ghul, which, again, like, in a cent- in centuries, he's come across someone maybe like a Batman. Jonah X is the closest to fit that bill. Mm-hmm. And uh, here you have, like, a sheriff who's, again, like, kind of like a, kind of a Bullocky type, just kind of tough talking and thinking he can... <laughs> he can, he can bother <laughs> Jonah Hex. So he, I love this. So he points out that Hex is a little past his, he's a little past it. He's past his prime. And this is the really cool thing about Jonah Hex too. And the reason he's so perfect for a racial Ghoul episode. Jonah Hex is one of those characters you check in with during a year in the 1800s because he's been around and this is the older wise in Jonah Hex. He's got the long white hair. He's a little past it. And that's a really interesting. And I love that's the one we got in this episode. Not like the young Jonah Hex at the top of his game. This is like <laughs> the, that's so interesting, you know. That's them really gambling, like, a, like your Saturday morning. Uh, we're gonna go with the old cowboy. We're not going with like the young rooting, tooting, shooting cowboy. Sure, sure. It says, well, uh, this is like, oh, you will pass it. X. Well, when pushed, I can still, I can still shoot the, a fly between the wings. Given, I'll, I'll, I'll be it. I'll give him the lights right, and uh, it's a plump fly as he's looking <laughs> at the plump sheriff about the, showing his guns, intimidating him. Really funny. Of course, I got nothing on you, Hex, but remember, it's dead or alive. Maybe try alive this time. That's the first time for everything. So basically, in this opening scene with Jonah Hex, we've said everything we need to say about Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. We established he's not Batman. He kills people. We've established that. He's, uh, <laughs> he, uh, he, he has a reputation for getting the job done. He's got a reputation. He you know cares about you know women and children, that sort of thing. We've established all of our things here. And again, he's, he's a little past his prime. He's, he's the winter of his years. These are all really great elements that build for a great character. And again, new character, uh, big stride for the DC Universe. This is the first time we've breached into the DC Universe along with Zatanna. Like, these are first non-Batman story. Right. Okay. So she says uh, she'll take him uh, to the lead at midnight. So it's midnight. She rolls around there, basically in the mountain range, kind of canyony mountain range. Love this atmosphere, by the way. Love the atmosphere of the whole episode. You know, it's such a great change of pace. Yeah. So basically, we get some expo from a uh, really nice kind of Western expo from uh, from a barmaid character here. She says. Uh, he came in the town. Well, every time he comes in the town, he beats women uh, and he duels men unneededly. Which again, basically, he's just killing people and beating up women. This guy's a real prick. He really is. Uh, and he's he's not, uh, he's not in a hotel, uh, and it's fifty miles to the next town. But he's the clean sheets type, which means uh, so he, probably, he likes he likes sleeping on the dirt, just like the snake that he is. Oh no, he's that's the my, clean sheets type. That's my favorite line in the episode. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, she points out, very important plot point for her third act, she points out he showed up uh, when the Sky Monster showed up. The sheriff is too yellow to investigate. Sky Monster? He's wondering, what the heck are you talking about? Sky Monster? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's like this giant like, iron boat in the sky or something we've, we've seen him working on. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, we can, yeah, they're like these weird these weird glowing lights uh, in the night that we th- I think is connected to this Arcady guy. And, of course, uh, we see it in the distance. So now Jonah Hex has his lead. Uh, he invites her kindly to leave for her own protection. Really nice. Again, I love the I love the love the, the the southern comfort of Jonah Hex. Uh, she kisses him for luck and kisses him on the scarred side, which is which is admirable. Mm-hmm. So uh, let's see. Uh, good. Uh, she kisses him for luck. Nice sentiment, man. But uh, I, I like to make my own luck. Yeah, I'll remember that next time I see. You. Like you're gonna make it out of this cowboy. Yeah. All right. So he's sneaking into the cave uh once again drag i just have to highlight just the scale of the rock work and everything it's all very visually impressive and he stumbles upon an airship oh yeah all right so we get we get uh, a bunch of a uh, bunch of workers being uh being very much mistreated by this arcadey guy of course voiced by uh voiced by malcolm mcdowell which, again, is like them kind of realizing, hey, we got the guy from Royal Flash. But the one thing that was wrong with that movie, they made him actually look like the character more. So it's kind of a perfect <laughs> fusion. And Malcolm McDowell played him in the movie, and they got him looking like he does in the book. So the covers, and all that, it's really cool. And the big moment, and, and uh, big moment, Raj Ghoul just comes in and is like, no, don't treat the workers like that. You know, like, it doesn't matter of the, about the efficiency. You have to treat our workforce good. And uh, that is Raja Ghoul to a T, man. You know what I mean? It's like this this guy's got a plan, but he's not going to sacrifice the, uh, you know, the human element of it to get it done. 
Certainly. And again, it's it's also Raish being super smart here where it's like, no, don't don't be that. Don't be the idiot who's just like literally mustache twirly evil where I got to whip these guys because I'm a bad guy. Like, don't be that guy. We need don't be just there from Les Miserables, essentially. For, pretty much. And speaking of what <laughs> Victorian Rachel Ghoul in a top hat monocle, but how do you get any better than that? <laughs> it is pretty <laughs> awesome, yeah. <laughs> so like also these workmen, by the way, like the guy who drops the lead coil and a bunch of these workmen, uh, they're in these awesome looking lead suits uh-huh. as these black uh-huh. and smelting guys. And so it's so freaking cool. Again, it's like it's the art deco meets the western. It's awesome. <laughs> but yeah, so that's like Rachel's smart enough to know, like, you know, we don't want to you know, like her workforce here because they're working towards the goal here. And even if Raish cares about him or he doesn't, he needs to get the job done. So it's like, no, exactly. don't, don't get in the way of progress here. I feel like it's probably more so like just keeping the workforce happy and, you know, keeping yeah. them under their thumb. But uh, still, you know, it's very, you know, very much uh, very strategic on Raish's part. Sorry. Anyways. Yeah. And the, and the bigger thing, too, uh, this, that kind of bleeds into the really the next moment that Raish does here is that it's. Raish knows how to rally a workforce. Again, like all the League yeah, of Assassins yeah. guys, they will die for him. And again, you get to see that at work here. Even with these guys in the Old West, they're all flock. They all believe in what he's doing. They all love this guy. And exactly. that's the thing. Even if Raish doesn't reciprocate, like, he made them believe that, that, that this guy, he care, he cares about our well-being. And, he, and again, for some to, to an extent, he does. And it's like, good men are hard to find in these parts, and there's much, there's much to be done. And of course, he goes about this really excellent thing. Here. Oh, the Western expansion is, is destroying this land. A drastic step must be taken to preserve the wilderness and Ra's al Ghul is the man to do it who better than I and this is this series I love so much this episode as a whole is like a missing puzzle piece to Demon's Quest you don't need it but when you have it it's really cool because this is the conversation he had with Batman Demon's Quest about the saving the rainforest sure sure where basically it's like you know uh, I am qualified yes this is the precursor to that conversation uh, where you know I'll destroy the railroad and bomb the other junctions as we move, uh, as we move eastward to Washington, when Washington is in flames, I will force the government to make me master of America. And they're all cheering and clapping for it. <laughs> That's such and a rage act cool ideal, just to be the master of America. And again, <laughs> I love better, the phrasing on that. Infinitely better than Wild Wild West. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, like you said, the workforce is just cheering them on very vigilantly. Uh, meanwhile, Arcadia Jonah kind of looking in on this. Go ahead. Arcady is not pleased. Yeah. Go ahead. Right. Oh, and then uh, then Hex. Hex found, uh, yeah, Hex, Hex has found he's firing a pistol at these guys. And again, we can get away with it on Saturday morning because they're wearing these iron suits. They're okay. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Do you think the iron suits are maybe just for the censorship? I mean, they look cool and it's a cool idea, but at the same time, it's, you know, it's very much a practical way to move around that. I think it's primarily for the gunshot bit. I think that's uh-huh. why they're in the iron suits. And I think the rest, <laughs> but it, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's why. Right. So then we have this brutal beating in, in silhouette, too. Man, he gets beaten the crap out of. We don't see it, because, again, Saturday morning, but you see mm-hmm. it in the shadow. Oh, my God, he's just being tarnished. So, anyway, so then he's brought to Arcady. And these yeah. guys are perfect opposites, aren't they? Arcady versus... Uh, again, Jonah Hex is the bravest guy you're ever going to see. Oh, yeah, person. because, you know, of course, it's Arcady just, like, totally represents everything that Jonah Hex hates. That's the great thing about the dynamic here. It's exactly. just, like, Jonah Hex's worst enemy just incarnate. Yep. And again, Arcady, like that Flashman character he's kind of based on, the most cowardly guy ever. Sure, sure. Good thinks he's enough. good with the sword, but cowardly is all good out. Oh. <laughs> so he thinks, very arrogantly, he thinks, Jonah Hex is a government spy! And I looks at him, a disreputable looking one at that. <laughs> now, come on. That, that's just a slap at the face. You don't insult Jonah, you don't insult Raja Gould's style. Yeah, Rachel goes all about the respect for the F. Again, he was like, I want to meet one so brave. That's Rachel exactly. Gould's style. Exactly. Okay, he's like, oh, a disreputable looking one at that. One other fun fact. Uh, this job, this this uh, Arcady character, uh, Malcolm McDowell, eventually this gets him into Superman. He gets to play Metallo, and he's so good as Metallo. Oh, yeah, 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 right. I, yeah, for sure. All right. So, John Hex, long story short, he clarifies uh, that um, he, he don't care about no railroad. <laughs> He's, I've come for you, Arcady Duval. <laughs> for what you did to that girl back east, you tracked me down for, from 12 states? 
for that. I just, love how, I love how Jonah Hex is just like no question. Yeah, like it's it's not even a it's not even an issue. Of course, I would drag you down for, through fifty states if I had to. And the reward that don't hurt my feelings not either. <laughs> you know, once he gets two hundred bucks too, I mean he's not he's not an idiot. <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. But I do like how it, primarily you you know it's, yes, it's very clear that he is more about the justice. It is, and we know that later on, uh, absolutely, too. I mean, sure. of course, he's there. But the girl is why, is why he hasn't given up, like, okay, I'll, I'll find 200 I was on another job. I don't need this guy. Uh, they uh -huh. they kind of turn tail. And he said, you're either a liar or a fool. And of course, in the Old West, that's like, that's like in prison, you call someone the B word. You know, you don't do that. It's like the worst thing you call someone in the Old West, call him a liar. Just, right. I've known to be foolish, but no one calls me a liar and goes to bed happy. <laughs> so of course we see Arcady's coward uh, cowardness, and of course he overcompensates. Let's give him a lead bath. Oh so, God! Let's see if we can make both sides match. So before we can get really sadistic on on poor old Jonah Hex, there Rachel go awesomely stop, stop, and he's chewing out Arcady in front of the men. I love Rach chewing out <laughs> Arcady. He says, "You're bold. You're you're getting bold, aren't you, Arcady?" You know, first, you know, first you uh, and how you treat my men, and then how you de dealing with interlopers without me. Of course, he's very upset with him. He's taking him to to the woodshed. He says, "We have a spy. A spy. He looks more like a saddle bum to me." One of the great lines of the episode. <laughs> it's more like a saddle bum. All right. All right, so uh, to basically imprison him. I'll question him later. I have no doubt in my mind. How do you feel? I have no doubt in my mind. Raish would have, he would have believed Jonah Hex, he would have paid the bounty, and, and tr he said, I'll punish du Duval, just don't kill him. Yeah, 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 for sure, I could see no, that. No doubt, I mean, that's how that would have gone, but it uh, wouldn't <laughs> be an exciting episode. All right, so meanwhile, on Hell on Wheels. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Sorry, go ahead. So, uh, Hex, he's... um. So Hex is he's, he's, he's locked in a cell, uh, but he gets an idea uh, for an escape next morning. So you know, it goes from day, it goes from night to day. A guard brings him food. Uh, the cell seems empty. Old trick in the old west. The cell is empty. Guy enters, uh, and it's revealed Jonah Hex. He he dug into the soil and under the hay bed that was provided for him. He basically like jumped, you know, surprise attacks this guy, and bam, punches him. Punch transition, really nice. Mm -hmm. All right, and then on Hell on Wheels, sorry, yes. jumped the gun a little bit there. Yeah. All right, so uh, let's see. So the governor is uh, the governor of the Utah ter Territory is delivering a speech where, you know, it's like, there was nothing but wild here, and with hard work and dedication, we have hewn a civilized land. Crowd cheers. I like the little boy kind of like jumping over the people's shoulders to try and get a view. <laughs> It, it sets the mood nicely, does it not? It sets the mood like, all right, like this is like a group of people on the cusp of, you know, like establishing a new civilization. I don't know, as a history buff, I kind of was into it a little bit. It is, and I like what it's doing here is that uh, two things. So the governor here, he's uh, has a has a very has a, has a famous voice. Uh, this is Senator Patrick Leahy, the guy who's in a bunch of Batman movies. He cameos. He's in the he's the guy the Joker threatens in the Dark Knight, the old guy that he threatens okay. in the Dark Knight. And he's in Batman and Robin, Forever, and Dark Knight Rise. So they like to work him in, and he's also in here. Basically, 90s on, where we got Patrick Leahy in on Batman stuff, which is really cool. All right. Gotcha. But yet, the, the better thing, though, I love that we're providing the counterpoint to both the Ra's al Ghul's argument, where, again, like, there is something to be said for Manifest. No, yeah, absolutely. Nice That's thing. what I like about it, yeah. Because, again, like, the, Ra's, the point that Ra's al is kind of paving over here is that it's all about, like, we're connecting territories, we're being together, we're uniting the, you know, North America, essentially, which is, which is nice. But, again... At the cost of wilderness in the world, which is that that's 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 peeving race off. <laughs> okay, so the airship has taken it's flight. A little bit of an environmentalist theme with race there, always absolutely. kind of looming in the background. Eco terrorist, no question. Mm -hmm. So uh, the airship uh, basically crashes this little like kind of a little uh, golden railroad spike ceremony, like little opening the railroad thing. And uh, Jonah Hex, by the way, as he broke out from his cell, he ran towards the uh, ran towards like the, the airship and he just jumped on the rope, which is awesome too. And of course now now the, the thing is like bombing the crap out of the western town. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of cannon fire on this town from this airship. <laughs> yeah, uh, totally. Again, totally. It's, it's, it's very uh, it's a pretty riveting uh, action scene to be to be sure. 
Yeah, and again, good version of Wild Wild West. We can't stress that enough. So, <laughs> Ratio is a really nice bit. I feel like that just kind of sums up the whole episode. It does. <laughs> it really does. Because you have, you know, you can have like a government official of some kind, not the president, but the next best thing. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, Raish uh, here, he's, like, he's saying over the intercom, run if you value your lives. And again, he's giving a fair warning. But again, it's like fair warning, but no debate. Like, no, please don't do this. No, he's not. He's, he's, he's shutting that down. Like, no, I'm blowing the crap out of this place. I'm going to bomb the, the junction here. Just if you want to live, go. That's fine. Uh-huh. So uh, I love what this the scale of this thing. We block it blocks out the sun. This giant, you know, this giant airship. Which, by the way, coolest thing about the airship, it's the it's a precursor, it's the old west precursor to the blimps and the zeppelins we have in the animated yeah, series. How cool absolutely. is that? It, it kind of gives a logic to why we have the zeppelins in the animated series to an extent. Really good real building there for sure. Okay, so we see some Union soldiers and stuff. Uh, with their, they're kind of contending with a guy with a Gatling gun. Jonah Hex uh, kind of gets in on the action. He ropes up the gunman, climbs up, and we have this uh, some great action with Jonah Hex throughout the sequence. I mean, in a way, Dragon, what I admire about this episode is that in some ways, I'm not saying this is a bad thing at all. It's like, in a lot of ways, it is just kind of like one big action scene, you know what I mean? A lot of it is just the singular pursuit of Jonah Hex, you know, for this guy. Yeah, I like that it's not your conventional Old West kind of showdown. It's not like... It's not, kind of- it's not. Yeah, I, I like that, too. And I like how we tease that at the beginning with the bar thing, and then we instantly subvert it, and we go on a different story from there. Yeah. All right. <laughs> So there's a few bits, a few fun beats. Like he lights the match on a cannonball, and basically the cannonball it like, goes into, like the whole thing of bombs, and like there's a big blast in the airship, and like Ratio and company are like, oh, what was that? <laughs> so let's see. So then we have this. You know, this is the more things he really interesting. So Jonah Hex, he's not really much of a, not exactly the swordsman type right now. I mean, he mm-hmm. would have like a cavalry sword, but he doesn't really have that at the moment in this interpretation. So they kind of have to skirt the whole Jonah Hex's whole thing. Is he was a Confederate soldier, but he hated what the Confederacy stood for. Mm-hmm. That, he, he, that's basically that's why he wears the gray hat. That's the only real that's the only real point to it. That he he rejected those guys. He went to the Union, so he he, he defected. That would be a really interesting subject to tackle nowadays. It would be, yeah. Have to, especially now, yeah. I mean, you know, kind of yeah, fun, yeah, fun, absolutely. Yes, of course. Anyway, so yes, yeah, so the point being, uh, uh, he doesn't have a sword like he would have, but he has a. Uh, they throw a Bowie knife at him. He uses this giant Bowie knife as kind of his makeshift <laughs> sword to counter, which is awesome. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let's see. So he's doing some really cool things, like some like Errol Flynn in the Old West, if you was a very Errol totally, Flynn set totally. piece. Yeah, at the very least. So then we have then we have the big namesake. I'll chop your head off. Talk, talk, talk. <laughs> so mm-hmm. we have the showdown with Arcady. They had to cut a minute of footage here. This really cool bit how you saw Arcady get a sword. We basically punched out a poor worker after Race like talked down to him. Punched like three. They basically shoved the guy and grabbed the sword, and he kind of left the room to basically to this scene. They had to cut that for time, but just to show you how much of a prick the guy was. Anyway, yes, the big the big namesake showdown. These two guys. You why? I guess I keep turning up like a bad penny. Why? Because you? Because I don't like something. Lights in this episode, Dragon. I love it. Yeah, he does. You want to get on get on some of those? Uh, well, I mean, you're going through pretty efficiently, so I'll, if I see one that I like, I'll, I'll let you know. Sure. So this is like, you know, because I don't like you or you're kind. <laughs> then we have the big moment, man. Oh, God, this is, the timing on this is perfect. Where basically he, he, like, kicks a cannon and turns it upwards. And, of course, there's a big, there's a little, like, little seed moment earlier on where Jonah X has been trying to blow up the thing, but, uh, he didn't get the gunpowder, so he's doing the next best thing. <laughs> what he does is, uh... The hydrogen cells, it's like the Hindenburg kids. The hydrogen cells are like, that's kind of what's given the thing lift. It's, it's given the airship able to put it in the air. And essentially, Jonah Hex, as, as RK warned, like, no, be careful of the hydrogen cells. Of course, like, wait, what are you doing? Jonah Hex just pulls, like, the line on the cannon. Boom! Explodes the, the hydrogen cells, and the thing goes down like the Hindenburg. So it's a sinking airship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is awesome. The cavalry thinks, oh, hey, look, we did it. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's just kind of parachuting down at that point. Yep. Hiding themselves going down. Uh, Raish during this encounter. Raish exits on a Da Vinci a flying the flying machine, which is really cool. And here's the thing. As a kid, I love this because, Bob, I used to be enamored with the idea of Bob Kane was creating batting. And before we knew the Bill Finger of it all, 
Bob Kane had the whole Da Vinci flying machine quote applied to Batman, which I learned from Mark Tyler Nobman, like in person. I asked him about this, and he said, "He said, oh yeah, no, that was made up." He was like, "Oh no," and that was like the one thing I was hoping was true. <laughs> Darn it! That was like that. That's my favorite thing about Bob oh, man, but that's a, it's kind of a nod to the Bob Kane thing, the whole flying mm-hmm. machine. Anyway, so. Okay, so he orders his men to abandon ship, which is nice. Raish caring about the men. Shows they cared a little bit, like, tell the men to abandon ship, hence the parachutes. But what about Arcady? Leave that fool to his fate, and of course, big connective tissue moment. Leave him to his fate. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's kind of like, that's... Dragon, what I like about this episode is that throughout the whole episode, we don't really, like, we're kind of left guessing what the actual message of the story is, right? That's the mystery. That's the detective work we have to piece together as Batman is. Yeah, because you're just looking at it. it Okay, Raish had this kind of this wily partner. He wasn't, you know, this this guy was really, like, shooting from the hip type. You know, this guy was, like, all about, let's whip the guys. Let's let's not. (laughs) This is a very ill-suited partner for Raish. And you're wondering, yeah, I wonder where we're going with this. I mean, like, you know, but again, of course, ultimately, there's a huge, there's an added layer to all those scenes. Like, why this guy, why is Arcady so bothered when Raish talks down to him? Of course, now we know why. Of course, of course. Okay, and of course, why was this such a big plot point? They'd leave him to his fate, and of course, leave him to his fate. That's again, you're kind of putting the piece together. Okay, he must be the old man, but what what are we missing here? It's, it's excellent. Okay, so end of the battle here. Uh, you know, do Val and Hex they kind of battle out. We have the steam bit, which really hurts too. By the way, like he cuts like the valve off and it blasts him in the face again. Justice, man, just for him making fun of Joan Hex's face. Sha. <laughs> really. So in that moment, Joan Hex, this is awesome. Where he dives off the ship. He as the, right before it crashes into a canyon. He's yeah, yeah, yeah. He grabs Duval. He launch off the off the ship, and then this is the money moment. Literally the money moment of the episode here, where it's the money shot of Hex with us with his Bowie knife threatening Duval from his POV. It looks great. Duval, Duval, he he, he reaches out this bag of f- five thousand in gold. Five thousand in gold. Take it again. The cowardice of the whole Flashman thing. Yeah, and gee, like I feel like at that point, like Hex is like more insulted than ever about that. Like as if you know, like no, you're not getting off that easy, not by a long shot, buddy. Yeah, this ain't about money, boy. It's justice. <laughs> I aim to, I aim to, to give you some. Uh huh. So Hex, uh, so again, Hex, again, the idea here is that Hex, he's found more faith in the system and, and law in his older age than just, like, the na- the aimless bounty hunter of his youth, I think, is kind of the lesson here, too, as well. It's kind of like the whole past, with, you know, with winter of his years sort of element of the thing. Uh, so let me live, please. And, of course, Hex here, it's like, I will, but only because it's too much trouble hauling your carcass back east. Now, what do you make of that, Dragon? Do you, like, obviously, I don't take his word on surface level. Do you think, like you said, it's just because, like, in his old age, at this point, he's a little bit, like, he doesn't want to carry the burden anymore? Yeah, I think it's like the sheriff challenged him to bring him in alive, and Uh Hex is kind of wrote off. This is his first time for everything. I think in that moment, Hex kind of, again, this is applying to the whole justice thing, where, you know what, this guy... I shouldn't. I shouldn't just end. I shouldn't end the suffering. I shouldn't just make it quick. This guy deserves to kind of see like the long. You know. Oh, I like that. So it's kind of like a the, Southern Raider, Raiders moment. Yeah, it is. It is a Southern Raiders moment. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's that's exactly. It's that sort of like he doesn't. He could kill him. That'd be easy. He doesn't know the whole race does the Lazarus Pit thing of it all. He doesn't know. Sure. That much, like, how do you know? He might have changed this tune. But the point is, <laughs> You're right, right. As far as he's concerned, like this guy, I'm going to serve him justice. You know, he made a lot of people suffer for a long time. You know, that it's kind of that. And again, his in his older age, he wouldn't just fire from the hip and kill the guy like he would when he was younger. It's a little bit of that. So, gotcha. Okay, so he basically is hauling him back in the town. And also, it's the other fact we can't kill him on Saturday morning. So, yeah. of course, of course, <laughs> it's a little bit of that too. <laughs> Of course, he grabs his hat, um, grabs his hat, puts it on, and uh, I'm getting too old for this. Quotes a little Murtaugh. Page <laughs> from the book of Murtaugh. So, back to, the, I think, the best scene of the episode. Great as all that Jonah Hex stuff was. My favorite part of the episode. So, it comes Robin, together really well, for sure. It's one of the great Rachel Gould moments. <laughs> so, uh, Batman and Robin, uh, Robin's asking, like, uh, so... Uh, so what does that have to do with uh, with any of this? And Batman, Batman has figured it out. Batman knows because again, world's greatest detective, he knows. So we're at the airfield for this beautiful scene of Batman and Rachel will have this perfect exchange where Ubu is wheeling the old man to the plane so they, they can get out of there. I love how we had the I big love airship. Ubu, by the way, yeah, like he, doesn't have, he doesn't even have words this episode, but he's there, man. He's there. Gotta love that continuity. 
Yeah, look at again. Ubu's built some built some familiarity. Oh, Ubu, as you as you know, Dragon Ubu has grown on me significantly since his first appearance. Even without saying a word, it's like, yeah, hey, it's Ubu. It's like, yeah, right, 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 exactly, exactly. <laughs> so Ubu's wheeling Ar- uh, Arcady as we as we reveal to the uh, to the plane. Which again, I love that we have an airship in our in our in our Western setting, and also an airship in the modern day. Which again, like kind of then versus now. Which again is really cool. Like uh-huh. this big old plane. So Batman and Rachel have this wonderful encounter. Basically, we kind of exposit things to Robin and the audience as to for any of the kids who didn't follow along with the, the Lazarus Pit of it all here is that. So it's Arcady, but how? He must be over, must be over a hundred years old. It says yes, he served fifty years hard labor. No one expected him to live it. Mm-hmm. No one but Rachel Ghoul. No one but me. Of course, he reveals the pit, the Lazarus pit. That's that's how. Yes, but only when he was young. The idea he used that's how he used it when he was young, and maybe had some residual effects to last the fifty years. But after that, you know, it has not been kind. So. um... Anyways, it's like, a, but only, only when he was young, he can't do it now. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, he's just, basically, he's, he's a shell now. The, uh, the, the, the damage he suffered in prison left his mind shattered. The, the, the frivolities he saw, he suffered have left his mind shattered. Um, and I've lost track of him until now. It says, uh, you left, du- basically, he left Duval to his fate. Why come back now, Batman asked. And we have this, oh, I love this reveal so much. Did you think... In my 600 years of life, I sired only one offspring detective. <laughs> Which is great, and it's such a mind-blowing idea. And again, Rachel, he has at least, we know he has at least two daughters, but the idea, he, he might have had more during, during the ages. You know, he might have had more over the years. <laughs> you know, there's more than one Talia running run around. And, um, and basically, Rachel kind of points out the thing of the episode we learned, and why he treated Arcadia the way he did, is that Arcady was too unbalanced and cruel to rule my empire, which again, yet another Demon's Quest connection, because he told Batman he has no sons. He disowned him, and he knew he could never run the empire, and again, he lost track of him, so he could never find him, even if he wanted to, so... Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but, um... But, you know, why come back for him? I, 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 I couldn't forget about him. Mm-hmm. Can a father ever truly forget about his son? Beautiful, beautiful stuff. Um... Then we have this, the, the the parting away. I'm sorry, you want to take him to the parting aways? No, by all means, you've covered the rest of the scene. Go go for it. We have. I still have a few good years left, Detective. We'll cross swords another day. But for now, David Warner is perfect in this movie. Let me take my boy home. He just he just he just puts it on front street. Like Rachel Gould drops like the, the 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 class and the refinement. He just asks very genuinely, "Let me take my boy home." The two part ways respectfully, and again, Raish on another airship with his son again. It's uh, it's 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 something to behold. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, sorry, Dragon. I just I, I figured I'd just let you have the floor on that because I know how much you like to talk about the Raisha Ghoul moments, and I I frankly don't have anything to add to what you what you brought up there. So I, I apologize. I apologize. I always get in, honestly, I always get intimidated when we, uh, when we talk about Ray Jack Ghoul episodes, cause I'm just like, Oh man, dragon's going to talk circles around me. And I, I never really know what to do with them to tell you the truth. But, uh, just to transition into final thoughts here for the Jonah Hex stuff of this episode, which obviously you're way more into the, uh, to the Ray Jack Ghoul stuff, but for the Jonah Hex stuff, I, I, I loved it. I, I really thought that, you know, effectively, like, let's say if you cut out, I don't know, like, all the Ray Shagul stuff, all the Batman stuff, you're left with, like, roughly about, I don't know, I'd say, like, 17 minutes of Jonah Hex, and it's an awesome 17 minutes. I mean, I love the atmosphere, I love the, uh, you know, the bits of real building we get with the airships, uh, you know, all the, uh, all the, all the cool things we do with, you know, the timeline in relation to Rage. Uh, just overall, really cool episode, and you can speak way more eloquently about the ending than I can. So I, I'm sorry if I left you hanging, but I only left you hanging because I know that, I know that you, uh, you know, you very much are much more well versed in speaking to this than I am. So, all right, all right. Uh, final thoughts for me. Um, it showed down. It's an unconventional Batman episode for sure, and that Batman's barely in the episode. Uh, <laughs> but in many respects, it. Um, 
it is kind of the birth of the DCAU uh, with you know this and the Zatanna episode, especially. I mean, this one's more of a, Zatanna is this naturally fit into the Batman world a little bit more. This is like we're really stepping outside the world of Batman for the first time because you don't get Superman, you don't get the rest of it without an episode like this where we kind of dip our toe in the, and things outside of Batman in the Batman show. Mm-hmm. It's really big, really kind of monumental. In this uh, this is a wonderful send off for Ra's al Ghul in many respects because you don't see him. This is the last time we see Ra's in the old style. You're gonna see him again in mainly Batman Beyond, but it's like once in the, there's like a Superman crosshair. The point is you you'll never see Ra's like this again. It is a good send off then, and that's what I'm saying. It's kind of this perfect. It, it's it's very classy. It's the episode. It, it, this ending is it's very classy. It's it's grounded with the history, with the setting, and then the royal flashman. Well, this episode just feels so so well conceived and constructed despite being really unconventional it's it's the old west meets the uh, art deco world of batman the animated series it's the episode is again it's like that missing puzzle piece in the racial ghoul story you don't need it but it fills in the blanks quite nicely uh you know jonah hex as said can be he can be really cool he's a you know he's a solid uh, you're sold on the character for sure uh, and I'm sure this kind of sells the character to the next generation too. Like anyone who had not had no idea who Jonah Hex was, and you know, people are a little unfamiliar with Jonah Hex. I'm sure they watched this episode like, oh my god, the Hex guy's cool. I gotta look into this guy a little bit more. Scarred Cowboy. Who knew? Dragon. Right. So, um, episode perfectly captures season three and the whole Adventures of Batman and Robin Hood. Good stuff. All right. So bring us out. <clears throat> the Riddler returns. A commercial caper. An explosive ending? Can the Riddler overcome his obsession? Will living well be the best revenge? And can the Batman truly be safe in a world where the Riddler wins? Tune in next time to find out. Same animated bat time, same animated bat place. On the next episode of the Animated Bat Cave with Riddler's Reform. Just to pay for my piano lessons.